after four o'clock and uh, you're all still joining us. But uh, as Prakash says, I'm a bit of a taskmaster and we'll kick off on time, respect everybody's time that you are giving to us on a Saturday. So you're all very welcome to Behavioural Science Club all over the world. And today we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Pavan Soni. Uh, I feel like I've got a bit of an advantage over Pavan because he doesn't know me, but I saw him speak uh, with Steve. Steve is our other member at uh, Prakash's Now Fest. So I've got one over on you there, Pavan, and I know you, but you don't know me. So I'm going to introduce uh, Pavan. He is an innovation evangelist, a teacher, founder of Inflection Point and also author of a new book published last October called Design Your Thinking, which is described as a practitioner's perspective on how the method and discipline of design thinking can be applied across a range of domains and help us become expert problem solvers. As I said, he was a guest on NowFest 2020, hosted a panel talk on design thinking with our regular club attendee, Steve Udit in Trinidad. And so, Pavan, uh, turning to you there now, why don't you tell us uh, exactly what you mean when you say you're an innovation evangelist? I mean, surely uh, we're all into a bit of innovation. So what is an innovation evangelist? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you so much for asking that. So uh, when I was uh, studying and in the early years of my working, I had this role model um, and he's Guy Kawasaki. So Guy Kawasaki was the first evangelist or the marketing evangelist for Apple. And when I used to work in Wipro, I had this task of making people believe that three things. The first thing is that people, uh, anybody can innovate. Second thing is innovation is methodical. And third thing is that innovation can be taught. Now, if I go back to the history, evangelists were created by church to make people believe in God. And the only way you can make people believe in God is by the act of God. And hence my job, actually my formal title in the organization was innovation evangelist and I had that on my card. So my job was to go across the country and I covered the length and breadth of India, going to schools, colleges, organizations, did camps with a single objective that how do I make people believe that innovation is for you and you can really innovate methodically. And then I went on to do my PhD program where my thrust of the PhD program itself was uh, innovation culture formation. And that led me to create this organization called Inflection Point. So I think over the last 16 years now that I've been an innovation evangelist, the sole objective has been to make people believe that innovation is not something which is either the reserve of the scientists or the artists, but it is for everyone. So that's innovation evangelist. Thanks, Pavan. And I, I'm relieved there because I thought uh, after talking about the gods, you were going to say something like my business card said innovation god, and I was going to be like, oh gosh, who have we got here now? So that's, that was a bit of a relief. Um, now, the other interesting thing, Pavan, or interesting to me is that Reading about your book, I saw that uh, you said, uh, this is at, at, at pretty near the start of the book, you say it's a discourse on creativity and design thinking, but today's discourse is disproportionately oriented towards the Western audiences and industries. So you draw very large examples in your book, not only from Western industries, but from Indian organizations. So what are you trying to address here, Pavan? Yeah. So when I talk to people about design thinking, there are three misconceptions about design thinking and it still are very deep rooted. The first misconception is that design thinking is for product companies. While design as a philosophy comes from industrial design, product design and architecture, but design is not about product. I strongly believe that the competitive differentiation has shifted from products to services to experiences. So design thinking is about designing experiences. And the product and service is just a via media. So that's the first myth which I want to burst. The second myth is that design thinking is for technology organizations and that to start up large organizations, which are, you know, 100,000 people strong cannot afford to do design thinking or companies which are more than a century old cannot do design thinking. That's another myth. 
So in my book, I have really skirted away from the startup tech heavy organizations and spoke up on, about day to day organizations on how they innovate. And the third big myth is that design thinking is only applicable to the Silicon Valley kind of organizations, a brick and mortar company, an organization which is in the rural part of India cannot do design thinking. So my thrust in design thinking is less on design and more on thinking. Because the word design is such a misnomer that the moment I talk to people about design thinking, they somehow think that hey, it's not for me because I don't have a degree in design or I don't do design. So I think I'm trying to reduce the barrier for people to really embrace design thinking. And I always believe that design thinking is not about designing. It's about thinking. It's about designing your thinking and hence the title of the book. So that's the myth bursting which I attempt. That's, that's great, Pam. It's really interesting. And um, so you're saying that any of us can be design thinkers. Does it mean that we have to step back from our way of thinking and start to think in a new way? Or how does one go about thinking as a design thinker? So thinking, I, I, it's a good question again. Thinking is a rare commodity. I'm increasingly believing that. We do not think as much as we think we do. And the reason it happens is because most of us, and I, I mean, not just the people who are in the leadership roles or in the managerial organizations, but most of us have been so much deprived of reasoning out our day-to-day -day activities that we go through the motions. As Daniel Kahneman keeps talking about, we are essentially system one thinkers. 95% of the decision making that we do is hardcore system one thinking. And we are not challenging our system one thinking. It was okay. For the last you know, million, million, millennia, it was absolutely okay. But now we have a, a contemporary available to us and that is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is pure play system one thinker. It is 100% system one thinker. There is hardly system two in AI so far. Now, if we are competing with machines, then I think it's a lost battle. And now for the very first time in our history, we are in a position to ask ourselves this question that what is unique to human beings? And I submit that uniqueness to human beings is not our physical strength. It's not our memory. It's not even our intelligence. What is unique to us are two things, empathy, and creativity and in that order empathy and creativity because machines will be creative but machines would take time to be empathetic now if we can take a step back and ask ourselves this question that on a day-to-day -day basis am i sleepwalking or am i really consciously solving problems in a very systematic methodical manner and am i developing consciously empathy towards people around me and am i being creative Instead of being intelligence, instead of being smart, or instead of having that quick fix attitude. And that's where there are three tips which I offer in my book. The first is a set of tool sets. As John Dewey very rightly said, he said, then I quote, that we don't learn through experience. Humans don't learn through experience. Humans learn by reflecting on the experience. Just because you solved a problem does not mean that you know how you solved it. The double loop learning, that's what we call, right? So it's a single loop learning. Solving a problem is single loop learning. But double loop learning happens when you start reflecting that, did I solve it right? Given a second chance, can I do it better? So tool sets, skill sets, and the mindset. If you can develop all these three, then I think we can really become better problem solvers, better thinkers, and machines for the very first time really in our history of evolution, machines are nudging us to think hard about what is unique to humans because we are really in and i'm not extrapolating over here because we have seen the pandemic has made us so dependent on technology so much dependent on technology even for our livelihood that we need to start asking this question to ourselves that hey finally between silica which is machines and carbon which is us we are mostly carbon and machines are mostly silicon between silicon and carbon do we really have some sort of a you know, uh, competition. And if so, what is unique to us? And I think our uniqueness, and I just quote, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos here. Jeff Bezos says that the highest form of intelligence is to be able to correct your opinion. 
with the reflections and with new realities. And I think thinking strong, thinking hard is something that we'll all benefit tremendously from. And now is the time to do so. That's fascinating, Parvan. Do you think that our uh, education systems today uh, do not allow young people to develop their thinking, uh, uh, to uh, think enough for themselves? in the way that we've become sort of churning out for exams and just learning as opposed to reflecting? It's a good question. So if I go to Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, one of the most famous TED talk ever is that school, how do school kills creativity, right? It's been watched millions of times world over. And it's almost fashionable to blame education system for the lack of creativity. But I would think and I maintain that it is not the education which is the problem. I think somewhere it is a parenting which is the problem. Because think about it for a moment. Where does a child spend most of her time? School or home? I think it's home. And this modern day education is only recent advent in our evolutionary time frame. 150 years, that's it. The way we think education must be done or it is being done, it is only 150 year old. Whereas parenting has been there for millions of years now. So I think parenting is where I would actually put the responsibility of creativity. If I look at some of the most eloquent innovators of the erstwhile era and the current era, many of them have been home educated, including the famous Thomas L. Edison. And in the last one year, almost everybody is getting home educated. Am I right? Because of the schools and colleges being shut down. And hence, for the very first time, the parents are feeling the heat that, hey, I can't delegate my child's creativity to my school. I can delegate my child's intelligence to the best school which I can pay the best money for. It is my responsibility. And there are three things. I'm a dad myself. And I'm realizing it increasingly that how it's very crucial for me to do three things for my daughter to become more creative. The first thing is I need to give her psychological safety. What I mean by psychological safety is that I need to make her realize that it's absolutely fine for her to fail. And I will just give you a simple example. I'm just returning from bicycling trip with her. And when I first taught her how to cycle, uh, the very fact that I was standing right behind her gave her the confidence that she would not fall down. She keeps messing around at the household, you know, doing things. But the psychological safety we can give, that's very, very critical for the child to blossom. That's the first thing. The second thing that we need to understand is unstructured playtime. Schools are becoming increasingly structured. And the structuring in terms of lectures, pedagogy, assignments, marks, evaluation, ranking structures, and same is happening at home. Discipline. I'm not against discipline, but we are unnecessarily boiling down discipline to waking up on time, eating food on time, going to bed on time, uh, watching television for so many number of minutes in a day. I think that is not how human mind is designed. Unstructured play, psychological safety, and the third aspect is, and this might be slightly controversial statement, which I'm going to make here, but it is increasingly dawning upon me as I am reflecting more during this pandemic, that the most important gift you can give to your spouse is your loyalty. The most important gift you can give to your spouse is your loyalty. And the most important gift you can give to your child is your attention. That's it attention nothing else i don't think any child craves for anything more than your attention so if parents can start paying attention to the small acts of their children to the way they are solving problems to the way they are being curious and addressing their curiosity i don't think we need schools because schools are there because somewhere i think the home schooling the parenting this whole model is getting collapsed and that's why we have day boarding school where you are almost Delegating your child, child's upbringing and psychological development, intellectual development to somebody else and paying the top of the class money and then expecting your child to be revolutionary, that ain't happening. You can't outsource your child's character building. So I think schools need to improve. I'm not against that. But I think parenting needs to improve much more than how schools have to because they are doing reasonably okay, I think. But the parents are somehow taking their foot off the pedal. And that's my real concern. 
Oh, the poor parents, Pavan. But loyalty to your partner. As I saw Joanne lean in on that. That was really beautiful. I love that. So uh, uh, that's been really super, Pavan. As you spoke there, I remembered I'd read something recently. I didn't know this, that the Chinese were actually the ones who uh, invented exams from their civil service. Um, and absolutely the importance of play and discovery we know that's extremely important so i'm glad you brought that up pavan and home education of course my, my children are older but i really really admire all the parents out there home educating it's what a what a struggle i'll just tell you really quickly i did a course recently and uh the guy giving the course had gone away on his yacht for a year and he tried to follow first of all the curriculum uh, set for his for his child for this year and he quickly realized that the child was learning more by fishing off the boat and being interested in in what was around him so he adapted his education pattern very quickly which is maybe something we could all learn from thanks so much Pav and I'm going to hand you over now to uh, Prakash and uh, Prakash will have a chat with you and then we'll open up for questions from all of the members thanks so much Pav Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. Uh, for folks who have just about joined in, uh, we are here today with uh, Dr. Paul and Sony. And there was a long list of achievements that he's got. Uh, he's been a gold medalist. Uh, he writes columns across multiple places. Uh, very well learned in India for promoting the cause of design thinking. And right now we're talking about all things design thinking and behavioral science. Uh, his book is available on Amazon, Flipkart, uh, other places. I see someone's asking me, where can I get a physical copy? I'll search and I'll let you know soon. It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is interesting about this particular book is it covers uh, more than 30 case studies, good number of them from India. So you get this Indian flavor, Indian perspective on uh, design thinking. Uh, there's also a lovely surprise gift at the end of the book. I will not tell you what it is. If you get your hands on the physical copy, and you'll see what I mean by the lovely surprise gift. It's totally worth it. Uh, before I, I put up a question, guys, uh, I just want to share my screen once because my question is connected to this. Uh, can, it, can you guys see what's on the screen right now? Right, so this is this vehicle. It, it's very famous in India. And essentially, what this is, is you take a motor pump, right? A water, water pump. Which, which pumps out water to irrigate your fields, right? And you take the engine out of that pump and then you can connect it you, to wheels and axles and you put up a you know, whole steering wheel and you turn it into a vehicle. And that is what is called Jugaad uh, in India. And the word Jugaad itself means hack, as in finding a hack, finding a workaround. Uh, India is very famous for its Jugaad culture, the innovation culture. And uh, so that is one reality of it. The other reality is something which I've heard uh, Pawan say multiple times about thinking. He keeps on saying, think with your hand, right? And the fact that people like to think with their mouth. Uh, yes. And the fact, third fact is he has just written a fantastic book on design thinking, a lot of cases about India. So uh, can you help us understand what is actually happening out here with, mm. with Jugar? with the thinking of the mouth as opposed to the hand and why there's still maybe a lot of hope for Indian companies when it comes to innovation. Oh, yeah. Well, well, well articulated Prakash. So I would want to reduce it down to culture. Let me invoke the research by Gert Hofstede. So Gert Hofstede, as many of you may be aware, did a you know, very in-depth study of country culture. And for those who are curious about country culture by Gerd Hofstede, just visit gerdhofstede.com. So he used to work in IBM in 1960s. Through 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, he studied almost all the countries across the world and identified them on five dimensions of culture. This is very, very important research. One of the most landmark research on culture, country culture, which has ever been conducted, very comprehensive. The first is power distance. Now, no marks to guess that between India and America, America definitely has low power distance. India has a very high power distance. Australia would have even lower power distance. Japan has very high power distance. So Japanese and most of the Oriental culture have very, very high power distance. So for example, only recently, only in the last 30 years, when the Indian IT industry started blossoming, 
is the very first time that in India people started calling their supervisors by their first name. As you would never call your supervisor by your first name, you would always call him or there was typically him, there was hardly any her, by the way, in India. Uh, sir, boss, G. G is like San. In, in, uh, in Japanese, they call San. You can't write a Japanese email without putting a San behind a person's name. That is very, very strict in Japanese. So power distance, India is very high. Second thing is masculine versus feminine. Now, India is a very masculine culture. What I mean by masculine culture is not that Indians have more males for females. That's not what it masculine means. Indians, females also exhibit masculine traits. What is masculine trait versus what is feminine trait? If I look at Nordic nations, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, they are all feminine nations. It's not again their female more population, but feminine characteristics such as compassion is very high in those countries. And that's why Volvo invented seat belts because they're very compassionate about human safety. Not that a lot of people were dying there, but that's compassion. In India, we are aggressive. Compassion is very low. And you have to see our traffic situation to understand the aggression, especially in the northern part of our country. Very aggressive people. So we are more masculine. Third thing is, so against feminine, we are very masculine. Third is collectivism versus individualism. One of the most individualistic countries in the world is Israel. Highly individualistic culture in Israel. America, Australia, very individualistic. China, India, Pakistan, very collectivist culture. Now, what happens when you're in a collectivist culture is that if I have an idea, I will feel compelled to get people around me to agree on my idea. And by the time I'm getting everybody's collective agreement on that idea, the idea has diluted itself so much that I'm just looking at incrementalism. And as all of you would agree, incrementalism is the death of innovation. So once again, because of lack of individualistic appreciation, most of our ideas are improvement oriented and not radical ideas. That's fine. But the next two are very, very critical. And the most important factor where India gets a beating on is what Gert Hofstede talks as uncertainty avoidance. What I mean by uncertainty avoidance is how okay are people in the country with uncertainty? The country which is highest on uncertainty avoidance is perhaps Switzerland, Germany. And that's the reason they have impeccable engineering. Swiss watches, they are very, very particular about time. German engineers. Japanese improvement. India is absolutely fine if the trains do not run on time. But in Japan, if the Shinkansen Express leaves the station 10 seconds before time, they issue a national apology. Mind it, it's 10 seconds before time and not 10 seconds after time. They issue a national apology. That's Japan for you. If I put all this into the mix, India as a society is actually biased against radical innovation. Because of high power distance, very, very comfort with uncertainty, and very, very high on collectivist culture. Now, coming down to Jugaad. Jugaad is nothing but improvisation, thinking on the feet. And I, for a very long time, used to believe that Indians are better than anybody else in Jugaad. No, we are not better than anybody else in Jugaad. But we are more comfortable than anybody else in Jugaad. That's the thing. Because Jugaad is a human trait. It's not an Indian trait. It's a human trait. If I go to the prehistoric era, and if you have seen the movie Crudes, it's a very fascinating movie about invention. Crudes. Or even Wally, for example. Humans, if I reduce resources, we are absolutely good at improvisation. But what has happened is that while the world has moved from improvisation to improvement to innovation, Indians have somehow remained in that space. Why? We have remained in that space is primarily because we lack discipline. So if I have to reduce our inabilities to do so, it perhaps comes down to the lack of discipline. Look at TikTok. If anyone, if you've seen a TikTok video, you see tons of fantastic ideas coming from China, right? How to you know, stitch something, how to use your space properly, how to dress up quickly, how to eat something quickly, how to cool something up, how to make your house. All these are improvisations. So China is equally good as India is improvisation. And we can see all these small videos showing that. But I think we start loving it. We start accepting it. And that's my real risk. Because improvisation or Jugaad suffers from three things. The first thing is it is not reliable. Second, it is not repeatable. Third, it is not scalable. 
a solution that works in punjab doesn't go to haryana solution that works in rajasthan doesn't go to gujarat so it's not scalable and that's why we need to put a pause on celebrating this improvisation and that's what the book attempts to do that how do we move from an over reliance on improvisation to improvement imitate and then innovate so that's my submission prakash what a lovely answer and uh, for folks uh, i'm pretty much reminded about our, of our session with uh, patrick fagan earlier uh, last year i think what i'm going to do is pawan uh, i'm going to open this up for q and a almost right now because it's only fair when you have someone who is so knowledgeable uh, the hosts uh, they, they shut up and then they let the members talk with the guest straight up so guys please fire up your question uh, quickly because we is going to start picking them up one by one and direct them to power but before i go i uh, i think i would like to invite uh, steve uh, steve if you want to join in there was a certain conversation the two of you had during the now office and then at some point of time adam ferrier had joined us steve if you remember so the entire discussion about uh, his book stop listening to the customer and uh, which is uh, which is a very interesting book and then there's a quote which power mentioned in his book from steve jobs i think the customer does not know what he wants till you show it to him right and but then what we did was i think in that discussion we went down into an entire debate with with adam about is uh, design thinking legit or not steve you want to please get into the discussion out here please um yeah um you put me on the spot there prakash that is the uh, idea steve that's the idea um but thanks to everyone and and thanks also pavan um i too have been trying to get the book but now that i know there is a hard copy on amazon i i look for it um so yeah well you know i've i've read about an uh, um design thinking from the early days of its development in the d school at stanford with with the kellys of ideo um but because of my own sort of curiosity about these things i i've also looked at you know design thinking but not by that name you know because prior to design thinking there were things like uh, design methods movement designally ways of knowing but i like how pavan has sort of um extrapolated uh the the design from the you know the 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 traditional way of design thinking from the product um from the product design from the industrial design um so so i like that however i do feel that uh there is a big space for design practitioners in design thinking and i think it will be very very valuable for design practitioners to sort of understand um a lot of what pavan is saying um about design thinking primarily and i like this what what he has spoken about in so far as um as creativity because i i mean i teach young designers and i find one of the things that um that they really lack is is what 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 pavan was talking about there just now the unstructured play time and the psychological safety they lack that because i believe there are so so many demands in the world of design production to get it to market that you know no no one wants to fail so i mean you know i'm just kind of addressing these things via a conversation rather than answers because i i don't have answers i i have more questions i don't know if this is making sense at all but um i you know if if i could talk about design thinking also in as it maybe it's a relative to something that fine artists do and fine but fine artists never needed a name for that all right they they practiced they practiced in their studio 
And it was a practice in studio, which required all of the things, or, or, or they submitted to all of the, the points that, that Pavan had made, such as psychological safety, unstructured playtime, and many, many periods of deep attention, either that attention to work or attention from elsewhere. It's only lately um, we have some fine art educators publishing on studio thinking. It's very, that's a very recent thing within about maybe the last 10, 15 years. But so what, what I'd like to end up with, you know, is that even as we look at design thinking as a creative enterprise and, and fine art practice also as a creative enterprise, I think one has sort of driven itself into an, that whole industry of design thinking. And the other one has pretty much just remained, um, but grown in its own place of, you know, just, just practice, just practice. So I, I don't know, you know, where this is going, but these are just some of my thoughts. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Pawan, well, there is a lovely question. Uh, Steve was talking about creativity and Luis, I just want to point the first question. Uh, can you make it to this question and then we can start it because it's connected to the exact opposite side, which is logic. Tony, you want to unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Hey, uh, Pavan, I, I really like what you have to say. This is this is really great information. It seems like you're you know you're just a very logical guy. I, I tend to be kind of right brains, you know, a little little looser. Uh, I'm I'm very comfortable with uncertainty. For example, I like that five points that you had, and but, but it seems like you're you're kind of the other the other way around. You have a very logical methodical approach to problems. Could you run that down for us so that we could kind of understand your process? Absolutely. So, so first thing, I believe that creativity, uh, I do not think creativity is the left brain versus right brain so much of a discussion. It is more of your prefrontal cortex. So the both and the left and the right have to come together because if left on left, if left on left, you would not have great ideas. But if left on right, you would not have right execution. Let me just repeat myself what I said. If left on left, you would not have great ideas. But if left on right, you would not have the right execution. Because people would just keep kind of coming up with more and more and more ideas and they would never be able to take anything to the logical conclusion. And I often believe that in most organizations, they have ideas looking for problems to solve. I have done more than 400 workshops on design thinking before I actually authored this book. And my sum total understanding of most of these organizations is as David Packard, the founder of HP rightly said, that most startups die because of indigestion and not because of starvation. Same applies to most organizations. There are so many ideas, but they're not able to take those ideas to a logical conclusion. And hence my recipe of design thinking is slightly different from what Stanford or IDEO advocates. And there are two stages that they completely miss out on and which is what I try to bring to the table. The first question is inspiration. Design thinking for what? Now, through my engagement, there are three types of organizations I have come across. The first is they want to know about design thinking. The second is they want to solve a problem using design thinking. And third is they want to build a culture of innovation, a culture of curiosity. And I've realized that the third type of organizations are the one that really take design thinking down to its DNA level. So the inspiration is very, very critical. Are you really setting the bar high and making people understand that, hey guys, we are not here to learn design thinking. We're here to solve a problem using design thinking. That's a very important thing. Because if it's about learning design thinking, you would equally be forgetting it as fast as you learned it. Unless there is an anchor problem. The second is again, empathize and define. Third is ideation. Fourth is test and prototype. The last is scale. My reservation with the current approach of design thinking is that once you have a validated idea, what next? And I've seen so many of these fantastic ideas not going anywhere. 
you have a lot of excitement you spoke to the customers but unless and until you are able to convert an idea into an invoice an idea into a scale it's not impactful because i for one believe that the only proof of innovation this might be a slightly controversial statement by the way tony but i would like to still put it up i strongly believe that the only proof of innovation is scale that's the only proof of innovation if you can't scale you're not innovating you're just creating unless you scale it up for example if prakash has to ensure that this kind of a setup goes on it cannot be about one speaker one day it has to be about over and over and over again he has to be running it for months and years together and only then he can claim that yes he created something impactful so that is where the discipline is very critical and i believe that for you to be a design thinker you need three aspects i typically try to reduce the recommendation points to three because it is easy to remember and easy to also articulate the first is you need to have a clear head clear head in terms of priority so one of as i was reading through the questions one of the comments was that is design thing about market orientation it's not about market orientation it's not even about customer orientation it is about human orientation and the human could be anybody for that matter it could be your employee employer spouse child supplier customer or anybody for that matter so the first is clear head what am i saying no to the second is a deep heart you need to have a deep heart you need to be able to empathize with people without are uh, being told that you need to empathize with them and the third which is the most rare skill the rarest of the skill is a thick skin you need to have a thick skin because the most you know distasteful part of design thinking is when people say that this idea doesn't work the customer doesn't like the idea this idea is not going to get us money and as uh, you know uh, stephen king very rightly said they need to learn to kill your darlings learning to kill your darlings is a very very difficult thing for an idea because you treat your ideas like your own child and you would never be willing to dismiss your idea so i think if we can really bring in a lot of uh, logic to design thinking i think corporates would really benefit from it otherwise this will become and remain a very fancy thing and that's where my reservation is actually thanks so much pavan thanks for replying to tony's uh, question i can tell you pavan I don't know if it's that you've particularly inspired everybody or just that they're desperate for a chat. I don't know if you guys had nobody else to talk to today, but there's so many flipping messages there. I have no idea how we're going to get through them all. So, Pavan, I'm, I'm glad to see that you are sort of looking at the chat as it went down. I was going to quickly uh, uh, have Tony's great question. Shrutin commented about uh, Danish parenting and, and put a, a book up there now if, you want to, if anyone wants to scroll back to find out about it. Priyanka was talking about school experience for, for thinking differently. Uh, Kathleen was talking about the importance of really listening to children, having real conversations. And Evgenia liked the connection of the role of parents to build creativity. Uh, Roma and Priyanka having a good old chat there now between themselves, and there were various forms of the is is the word jugad prakash saying that there's a, a variation in Brazil and also Indonesia. Um, we've got a good question here from Renusha. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, Renusha. Um, you're not so, on yeah. camera there. Yep, yeah, super, Renusha. You were asking about uh, in a VUCA world as yeah. in volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Yes. Let's go ahead. Yes, yes. So the thing is, in VUCA world, the uncertainty response attitude which India has, do you think, is it a, is it a good thing that we like uncertainty in India? Uh, I don't think so. So my belief here is that in a VUCA economy, you need to learn to think slow. And this might be very counterintuitive. slow down your thinking don't think fast if the world is moving fast and if you are also moving fast then you do not know what to really lock on to okay you need to learn to think slow just slow down your thinking because when you start to think slow you would be able to really distill out the vital few from the trivial many now being comfortable with ambiguity versus attracting ambiguity are two very different things i think where we lack is that we learn to attract ambiguity so that so much so that we actually wait for the ambiguity to kick in 
and that's not good for us. So I believe that while being comfortable with ambiguity is good, but then if you have to create institutions, if you have to leave a legacy behind, then we need to have systems which should be in place. And look at the current socio-political state that we are in. Enjoying ambiguity, I'm talking of India right now, enjoying ambiguity cannot be a hallmark that one could have. But at the same time, we need to have adaptability. So I would not want us to equate adaptability with being happy in chaos. Because once again, a quote which might be useful to you, think of the yin and yang of design thinking. The yin and yang, and all of you are familiar with the yin and yang image that comes from the uh, oriental culture. The yin and yang is that of chaos and discipline. And I always believe that without chaos, there is no evolution. But without discipline, there is no performance. You can't perform without discipline, but you can't evolve without chaos. So I think if we enjoy chaos, then we would not be able to perform to our collective might. And that's what I think, uh, Renusha, uh, is my concern with our ways of thinking. Got it. Lovely line on the chaos and performance piece. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. No, Luisa, you are on mute, I'm afraid. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, and uh, Sebastian, you have a question about non-weird countries. Would you like to ask Pavan? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Um, I don't know if everyone has heard about that, um, that term that is now so popular, but uh, I think that Pavan, you probably have heard in your research as well, and uh, when you were uh, writing your book. But do you find that uh, uh, that, as uh, Ranusha was mentioning before, and uh, uh, with the Buka concept, and now with the non-weir, right? So uh, the Western, educated, industrialized, uh, and rich, and democrat uh, demo yeah, democratic countries. Uh, do you find a common pattern on that uh, in terms of the emerging uh, economies and the influence that we have from the research that has been conducted and our capabilities for design thinking and for thinking a little bit more creatively? Yeah, so let us, let us go back to history. 2,000 years back, the epicenter of knowledge and commerce was East, 2,000 years back. It was China, it was India. That was the epicenter. There was hardly any West. Over the last 2000 years, and it got really accelerated with the Industrial Revolution and prior to that, the Renaissance. Starting with the 14th century, the pendulum has for sure been swinging from East to West. If today I talk about East, and we in Hindi have this very, very beautiful saying that in the Western civilization, they created Yantra. Yantra means instruments. In the Eastern civilization, we created Mantra. Mantra means, uh, Prakash, mantra means? Chants or, you know. It's chants, I guess, or. Chants, mantra. Yantra Tantra Mantra, right? Yantra Tantra Mantra. Yes. So the Yantra means instruments. So while the Western world looked at external engineering, the Eastern world looked at internal engineering. Internal engineering. Mm -hmm. And now the we are in the crossroads. We're at the crossroads and literally at the crossroads because of the fact that we now need to understand that while we are setting our foot on Mars, are we really able to understand our own psychology, our own constitution, human body's constitution, our thinking patterns as much as we claim to? While we understood the bosons and the neurons, are we really able to understand human body? And I think the answer has been long discovered in the Oriental culture. So I believe that if I remove the word design from design thinking and just think of thinking, then I believe that the Eastern philosophies are really eons ahead of what the world is coming to grasp with. Because we have still yet to contemplate on very fundamental issues about our existence, our purpose. What is the contribution that we all are trying to make over here? And if we miss out on those existential questions, then we might have amazingly good looking products but they might be serving a very, very small portion of the world. And look at what we have led ourselves to. With all the industrial revolution that we have, we have actually made many, many more people worse off than a few people being better off. And we are here to see the results. And that's why I invoke the two important principles, empathy and creativity. Where we have really focused on is a third element, which is intelligence. 
And as all these students of Lewis Terman have realized over the last 100 years, that intelligence is not the factor for us to be really looking at. It is empathy. And I think if for all the negatives that India may have, by the way, that's one thing that we are. We are empathetic people. And that's one thing that I think we can possibly teach. Uh, so that's my response that the non weird world is actually getting worse off because of an overt focus on external engineering. And there is a time for you to do internal engineering and cleansing your way of thinking. So that would be the way I would like to think it, Sebastian. Thanks, Thank you. Sebastian. Thank you. Great question, Sebastian. And uh, Pavan, we were all very interested when you were talking about the male and female characteristics of countries. And uh, Mariah, I think you were interested in that. Uh, would you like to ask your question? You're asking about India and its maleness. You thought it wasn't so unique. Right, because I feel like almost it's a bit of propaganda for India. And I, I can see from the audience that we have a lot. Uh, of uh, nationalities or people that have that nationality. But I, in my opinion, I think it goes back to um, a culture, um, a geography, a, a particular location that has a few factors. And one of my thoughts is that could it be because you have multiple people in a household, multiple generations. So the children are brought up with different influences from not only grandparents, but great grandparents from mother's side, from father's side, parents, um, neighbors. I feel that that's the deeper root here. And that could be something that is available, for example, in Romania. When I grew up, we have similar traits to Indian folk. Um, in other parts of the world, like Moldova, Ukraine, where you have these inter multiple generations coming together to help raise the child and we even have in the western world the saying with a village that raises a child um, unfortunately through all of these external engineering uh, we moved away from that concept that was in england two three hundred years ago so um that's kind of what i'm thinking i don't know how um, our speaker will feel uh, with my comments. I completely agree with you. It's just that I know uh, the culture slightly better, that's all. But I'm no way contesting. The roots, what you identified is absolutely the reason. Because of the very high population density and number two, the prevalence of big families as against nuclear families, some of these aspects are very pronounced. And that is where I would like to link it back to empathy. Mm -hmm. And the reason why empathy is still very much seen and the the covid in the last 12 months the covid really made me believe about empathy i wouldn't have been arguing about empathy so much by the way but the way the rural part of india has managed this you know economic social political upheaval health upheaval in the last one year because of the pandemic i think there is a very very interesting case for us to think about that is empathy a hallmark. And I'm not saying that this is the most empathetic country. I'm not at all saying that. But what I'm saying is that for us to be good problem solvers, we need to be more empathetic. That's my submission. Mm -hmm. And I think we develop empathy when we interact with more people coming from different levels of society, different age groups, different issues. Uh, and that is prevalent in an extended family versus yes. a single family. And it could be anywhere in the world. That extended Absolutely. family could be anywhere in the world. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Well, thank the Lord that we have more than one India. <laughs> Thanks, Mariah. And Joanne, would you like to ask your question? Because um, it sort of links in with what Mariah was talking about um, when you were uh, chatting about uh, the Emily Oster book, which I'm not familiar with. Would you like to just elaborate on that, Joanne? Yeah, no, um, Pavan, I really uh, enjoyed your 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 talk. It it's uh, um, it struck a, 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 a chord with me, um, especially about uh, the you know importance of empathy. But um, back to your ideas about that 
you're advoc advocating homeschooling and um, and I have to say that I am homeschooling at, at the moment and luckily uh, I'm uh, just between jobs so it's it's working out fine but if I had to balance this homeschooling with uh, a job it would be it would be very very stressful as I think a lot of women have found and it, and it is falling to, to to women in the in the, in the majority sorry guys but it is so what i was my question was that the um emily otter uh, described how spending time with your kids it has mar marginal costs uh she, she's an e econom e um economist who's who's thought about parenting and uh, how we parent and you know the first first hour you come home from work it's great everybody's glad to see each other second hour not so good you know by the third hour you've run out of steam and and you know you, you need you need to do other things within you've got so many other things pulling is pulling you away to to do that you know that you need you, you cannot do this um uh without a professional support is is uh, is what i'm saying but what i have found um with jay uh my son's educate homeschooling is that they especially well in the scottish system they they are trying to um uh to introduce more creative thinking and uh not such more rote or regurgitation of um of uh, of information which i think is 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 great but um no i was what you know I, I was just wondering like that that ideal of you know us being the teachers is is just doesn't seem to be realistic to me i i don't know if that sort of contradicts what you were saying about you know the the educational system i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of you know with anything in life there's 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 negatives and positives but i think the kids are missing their friends and their structure and being away from us in in in, in one way absolutely correct absolutely and the whole world is waiting for the schools to open so that the kids can go to school and parents can go to the economic engine now here is a question let's do a thought experiment okay all of us let's do a simple thought experiment if tomorrow morning we realize that school as an entity is closed would we be able to raise our children educated would we as parents have the same capabilities to raise our children as well as school would that's the question that we need to answer or have we lost the ability as a parent that perhaps our great 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 grandparents had whether you call it apprenticeship or you call it uh, being in the same profession or the family business or life skills or common sense do we have those traits that we can confidently say that in the absence of school i'll make my child self-dependent my real risk is that this division of labor has actually made us worst off and we are very conveniently placing the blame of our child's underperformance in the real world to school to the school curriculum to the teacher training in a way that is okay but we cannot dismiss the fact that after all we are the ones who are bringing these children to the world and it is primarily our responsibility to ensure that they turn out to be responsible contributing citizens school is just one entity just like any other institution in the country it's the parallel which i would want to say here is that can you blame police only for the law and order in your city or should you not be responsible to every single citizen similarly i think that over reliance on schooling system and because very conveniently we go back to that economic engine which is in many ways by the way i might be displeasing a couple of people on the audience today but we find that to be our comfort zone and not teaching our kids is our comfort zone that's the problem if that happens then perhaps you know schooling as a system might get a lot of contribution from the parents and not that we blame schools for our kids not being creative so it, it might be that we have to really pick up those skills as teachers that's how i would like to think about and the pandemic actually forced us to think about those realities that what if school doesn't exist can we still teach our parents maths physics and, and all these things important for the for the time being or just that we have been so used to it 
for all these years that there is no alternate that we can think of. So it may be a reason for us to think now. Okay, thank you, Pavan. Thanks, Joanne. Great question. And I don't think any of us coming here today thought the uh, conversation was going to go in this direction. We ended up talking about uh, child rearing and extremely philosophical insights there, Pavan. It's got very, got very deep indeed. There have been amazing questions in the chat. We just haven't had a chance to get through all of them. Uh, I'm very aware that we're coming up uh, to the time to uh, wrap up, so another five minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hand over to uh, Prakash to uh, chat with you to wrap this up, Pavan, and uh, then we'll be uh, wrapping it up. So thanks so much, Pavan. Thank everybody for your fantastic questions today. It's really insightful. Thanks, Prakash. Um, thank you, Louise. And, uh, uh I am taking the liberty uh, to just say find power on LinkedIn. He has got some 20,000 followers. But find him, add him, and, and put up a question. I mean, he, he's a teacher at heart. Uh, teacher by passion is how he uh, introduces himself, right? Uh, so I'm sure those questions that we could not answer right now, he will find the answers eventually, I hope. He has a busy schedule. But I'm sure he'll find a way to help us, right? Uh, please, for folks of this session, definitely find time, power, uh, right? Before we go, uh, I think one one of the last questions that I want to touch on, I think, would be around uh, what can we do, right? We are almost done with We have four minutes remaining, and the weekend is here. It's February. We had some resolutions in our lives. Uh, they are broken. Uh, we are not able to keep them together. The new year is kind of an old thing already. But is there one advice that you can give to us as people out here saying, you know what, even if you can't do it all, just speak to this one thing. It might help yeah, you. Three, like yeah, that. so I would, I would rather have three things which all of us can cultivate. The first and the foremost thing is, let's be good listeners. Because unfortunately, a huge amount of our efforts whenever it comes to communication has been on speaking well. But listening well is a really underrated skill. Be a very good listener. Try to listen more than speaking. That's the first important thing. Try to be a good listener. Because the world needs good listeners. World does not need another opinion. World needs someone to listen to those opinions. So that's very important thing. Be a good listener. The second important is, you we need to defer judgment. Let's not be judgmental. Unfortunately, what I've realized is that Expertise often comes at the cost of empathy. Expertise and empathy are almost orthogonal. The more an expert a person becomes, he or she is almost preparing the answer midway down the question. So expertise and empathy all, almost always comes at a loggerhead. So try to be less judgmental, less critical about people. It's absolutely fine if you're not able to gauge a person in the first meeting. It should be fine because it puts you under less stress to be able to conclude. And also it doesn't really puts the stress on the other person to behave any differently from what she is. So be a good listener, defer your judgment. And the third very critical thing, which I believe that all of us can truly benefit from is learn to focus. Right now, our, our environment has become so noisy that we have lost our ability to remain concentrated on anything for a long period of time. Frankly speaking, I could write this book only because of the amount of time I got sitting at home because of COVID. COVID was really a blessing in disguise. But having said that, it is very, very critical that we should be able to say no to 10 things, not even listening, say no to 10 things. And what Mahatma Gandhi very rightly said, in Hindi used to say that, bura mat kaho, bura mat suno, bura mat bolo. Don't see wrong, don't hear wrong, don't speak wrong, which is so true. So I think if we can really learn to believe in this phrase, which is ignorance is blessing, you're absolutely fine to be ignorant about things. It should be fine. So be focused, be a good listener, and don't be judgmental about people. This way you would automatically become empathetic and hence become more useful to people around you. So that's my submission, Prakash. Thank you, Prakash. 
Thank you so much, uh, Pawan. It was an absolute pleasure having you out here. I know your schedule is quite busy, uh, so we appreciate this. Uh, Thank you so much. The time for folks out here, uh, Design Your Thinking is available on Amazon, both e version and the hard copy. Uh, it's got more than 30 plus case studies, and it's a brilliant synthesis of years and years of teaching experiences, workshop, more than 400 workshops that Pawan has run, more than 50 books, and hundreds of research paper, all synthesized. There's a surprise gift at the end of the hardcover uh, edition. So look out for that and stay safe. Take care. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thanks, Pavan. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.